Hello everyone and welcome to The Empowering Neurologist. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Today we're going to be chatting with Dr. Josh Axe. Uh, Dr. Axe uh, wants us to eat dirt. Uh, maybe not exactly literally, but he has a thesis that we're going to explore. In fact, it is the uh, title of his new book, Eat Dirt. And to be sure, uh, it's not about going out and eating dirt, but it's about the importance of understanding uh, microbes in our world in terms of how our microbiome is affected, uh, the microbes throughout our living systems, how they interact with our health, how they influence our physiology and our risk for disease. It's a very compelling book and we're going to talk about that today, but let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Axe. Uh, he's a, a doctor of natural medicine. If you're on the internet at all and you're looking up a topic, by uh, you're, you're very likely to see his work. Uh, he is a nutritionist and author, and he really has a passion to help people not only get well uh, using food as medicine, but stay well and preserve their health. He operates one of the world's largest natural health websites, which you probably know about, draxe.com. We'll have a graphic for that uh, later in the program. Uh, he's been a physician for many world-class athletes, and in fact, uh, in 2009, he began working with the Wellness Advisory Council and traveled to the 2012 uh, Summer Olympic Games, which are held in London, where he worked with uh, some of America's finest athletes. He's an expert also in herbal medicine, nutrition, digestive health, and as you would expect, of course, athletic performance. He's been seen on many television programs uh, around the nation, including uh, CBS uh, programs, NBC, and of course, uh, Dr. Oz. Uh, in his spare time, when he's not uh, blogging and informing us all, he competes in triathlons and cross trains. Uh, his wife is also a very much uh, an athletic, an avid athlete, uh, and we're really looking forward to today's interview. So let's welcome Dr. Josh Axe to the program. How are you doing today? Hey, great, Dr. David. Thanks for having me. Well, I am delighted. Uh, I, you know. As a plus for doing this type of work, I get to read people's books uh, early on when they first come out or even before they come out. And I was very, very taken uh, by your book. What a compelling title, Eat Dirt. And it really does say a lot. In your introduction, uh, you talk about kind of a, an epiphany in your life, a pivot point uh, that occurred when you were 24 and your mother had some health issues. Can we just jump right in and talk about that? Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, I, I think I, I see this all the time uh, to where when I'm doing interviews, I find a lot of people get in the health field because of crisis in their own personal life or their own family's life. And it was really the same with me. I grew up in a family that was always into uh, fitness. And so like my dad was a semi-pro water skier. My mom was my gym teacher in elementary school. She was a swim instructor, always really active. But at 40 years old, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And we lived in what I call just the conventional system of the time. So whenever we were sick, we you know got put on antibiotics. We um, didn't know anything about diet or nutrition. I mean, never paid it any attention. And so my mom went through the conventional system. She went and she had a mastectomy. She went through uh, several rounds of chemotherapy. And I can still remember to this day uh, watching her hair fall out and thinking she had aged 20 years in two weeks and just saying to myself, man, I, I never want to see anyone have to suffer through that again. And that's really what caused me to, to go into the field of, of natural medicine. And, and, I, and, and so from then on, actually, my mom, for the next 10 years after she was going through chemo or after she had went through chemo, she just continued to get worse and worse. She got put on, I know she was on about three medications. She get put, got put on an antidepressant. She was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, struggled with chronic constipation, chronic fatigue syndrome, and then uh, just just was, again, tired all the time. This went on for 10 years. And finally, 10 years later, I got a call from her. And at this point, I was actually working as a nutritionist in Orlando and uh, just started my, um, my, 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 my medical training. And she called me up and she said, I, I, hey, I've got really bad news. And she started crying. She said, I, I've been diagnosed with what they believe I, or is cancer. Again, There's they found tumors on my lungs. And she said, what do I do? And I, I said, I'm going to fly home, immediately flew home. And we really just talked it through. And, and we consulted with her oncologist and just said, you know what, Let, give us three months. We want to try some things naturally. And, and he said, okay. 
And so we just radically changed my mom's diet. I'd been learning some things at the time, but we started uh, juicing vegetables. She started doing bone broth, um, blueberries, and, and, and a number of foods. We started doing certain supplements. She started doing turmeric and uh, something called soil-based probiotics and vitamin D and uh, medicinal mushrooms called uh, cordyceps and, and many other things. And and the other big thing was, again, in changing her diet, we had her start doing this, this type of kefir. If you can, and I know you've taken care of a lot of patients, but one of her symptoms was she was having an average of one bowel movement a week. And that had been going on for two years. And after two weeks, her bowel movement started to regulate. She started going once a day. And then eventually it was, it was even more than that. So that was a big step. And the other thing was my mom was chronically stressed. She was a special ed teacher. And you could just, I mean, you could see the stress coming off of her. She dropped down to part time and then had the summer off. So we really got to take care of her. And she followed this program and protocol for four months. We went back to her oncologist and he did a receipt, a redid a CT scan. And he called us uh, two days later and he said, this is very unusual. He said, it's, it's incredible, actually. He said, your tumors of the largest tumor went from 2.5 centimeters down to 1.2. He said, I want you to go ahead and I don't know what you're doing, but keep go ahead and keep doing it and come back in, 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 in nine months. And we went back nine months later and uh, we, we saw uh, further progress. And uh, today, uh, my mom is cancer-free in the best shape of her life. She's in her mid-60s. She lives now in a place called Auburndale, Florida, just outside of Lakeland, and um, has great health. And so, you know, she's actually ran a few 5Ks with me in the past couple of years and finished second and third in her age group. And so, you know, this just really, uh, you know, that, that was big for, for me and just just getting ready to graduate. And something I've told my own patients for years, Dr. Perlmutter, is that I'm going to take care of you like I would my own family. And one of the things that I really saw and experienced with my mom is that she was so overwhelmed by her diagnosis, she was almost paralyzed. So when I flew home with her, I, I made her a, her own cookbook and I went through her pantry. We did this sort of like kitchen makeover with every getting a lot of the bad stuff out. I taught her how to make smoothies and how to use her crock pot. I mean, this she didn't know how to do a lot of that and w went shopping with her. And so I started doing the same thing with, with my patients, started doing shopping tours with them and, and did cookbooks and that type of thing. But, you know, that's, that, that was part of her transformation and why I, I wrote the, you know, my book, Eat Dirt, and why I practice the way I do today. We said uh, several things that really caught my attention. And the first, not in any particular order, was uh, the notion that the oncologist said to you, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. In my ideal world, what would happen is the oncologist would say, I don't know what you're doing, but tell me what you're doing because it works. And, um, you know, here's probably metastatic breast cancer. And we know what the survivability of that looks like, and it's not a, a very favorable. And here your mom made this incredible uh, progress to remission. And in an ideal world, you'd think people would want to know how in the heck you accomplished that. So. You, I, I guess you didn't, you know, convince the, the oncologist to learn about it, but you, you, fortunately you put it in your new book, which is really very <laughs> exciting. You also said something I think that was really very interesting, and that is you said your mom became very constipated, fatigued, and developed Hashimoto's thyroiditis as if those issues were seemingly disparate. I mean, you know that they're not. But, uh, you know, in our modern world of reductionism, uh, we look upon fatigue uh, constipation is a gastroenterologist problem. Thyroiditis is obviously going to be the endocrinologist issue. But yet, you know, here you then worked with her nutrition, basically worked with her gut. And your first quote in the book was, all disease begins in the gut. Um, you worked with her gut and everything resolved. So it's sort of a broad stroke approach centered on the gut for seem, seemingly very disparate issues. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that, you know, one, one of the, uh, actually, I know my, my mom has read your book and loves it, by the way. I know she read uh, Grain Brain here pretty recently, and I know you you cover this so well. But, you know, it, 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 it's absolutely true. You know, another just sort of side note, my mom lost almost 20 pounds in her first 30 days following this program. And it wasn't because we were trying to make her lose weight. It's because we were trying to get her body in that perfect healing environment. And I know that the emotional stress coupled with her toxic diet and the things she was eating, it was it was essentially the perfect storm for her to be sick. And I know that the constipation was something. And that was the other thing about my mom, too. It was she knew she had the health problems. She was also always stressing about her health problems. And 
and, and her constipation and all, all the other things she was going through. And then actually she had uh, several uh, goiters on her, um, on, on her thyroid and had cysts on her liver. I mean, she spent as much time stressing about her health as anything else as well. So when we started following, uh, when she started following these protocols, I mean, it, it's amazing. I know you see the same thing. It, it's amazing how fast the body can heal when you remove all of the stressors. And that's one of our, my biggest lessons as well. If somebody really is willing to go 100%, because that's the other thing. If, if my mom were in the position where she said, you know what, Josh, I, I'm, I'm going to do about 50% of what you asked me to. Um, I, I don't know that she'd be here today or I don't know that she would be in the great health she is, but I think that's another important thing to Well, to, I always to, say to halfway about. measures work halfway. And uh, if you were to ask somebody, well, do you want your cancer to be 50% gone? I think it, it kind of drives home the, me the message that you really got to go all in. Yeah, absolutely. You talk about in your book, you, know, you really focus on the, the fundamentals of the leaky gut, which has now entered mainstream parlance. You know, for those of us involved in functional medicine who've been talking about this for a couple of decades, you know, we were kind of ostracized for the notion of a leaky gut, even relating to the gut, much less related to uh, systemic issues like autoimmune conditions, etc. But on page 39, you mentioned this kind of vicious cycle, how the, the idea of a leaky gut is self-perpetuating, how it makes things worse that then get, you know, create this feed-forward cycle. Could you tell us about that? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things that I really started uh, noticing in, in, in patients is that a lot of similar symptoms came up, and I started uh, running blood work and blood analysis and sometimes urinalysis on patients and looking at things like, um, you know, IgG testing and stool testing and or organic acids, looking at maybe specific vitamin, mineral, and, and organic and uh, amino acid deficiencies. And one of the things that I noticed is it, it's it's almost shocking how many food sensitivities and intolerances people have. And so I really started noticing that that was, if, if I did a test, pretty much everybody has something. And of course, dairy and wheat show, show up very often. So that's one of the first, what I would say in the cycle, one of the biggest things I start to see in people is that there's this, we, we have this immune response and then inflammation, and then that can really turn into, and typically intestinal inflammation, and that intestinal inflammation can then turn into, you know, that zonulin production and those gates staying open within the intestines and things such as undigested food particles like gluten and toxins and, and you know, pathogenic bacteria leaking through into the gut, uh, uh, into the bloodstream, and then circulating, causing issues. You know, I with in Nashville here, I speak at a lot of uh, autism support groups and really saw this early on, you know, and, and this is really what kind of triggered me along with my mom into focusing more on the gut because I noticed with all of the children I took care of on the autism spectrum, they all had some form of dysbiosis or major digestive issues. And so when I really started working with those kids and I first thing I did is put them on a gluten-free and casein diet and then we started doing things like glutamine supplementation and some other things, but really just saw some fantastic results. And so, but you know, it, I had a mom come into me and she's and after just one week, she said, "This diet that I put you you had me put my son." She said he went from speaking he only knew three words. He he said forty words. She said I walked in his bedroom and and he and, she, and he said to me, "Hey mom, I want breakfast." She said I, I'd never heard, heard him do that before. And so really seeing that connection that I know you hit on in your book Grain Brain is, is that you know these things can affect the entire body when you start getting these proteins in the bloodstream that aren't broken down. Um, it can cause, you know, it can cause cause brain issues, but also it can cause uh, thyroid issues. It can cause joint issues. It can affect every single area of the body, and and your body will let that go on for so long until where finally it creates this autoimmune, this automatic response, and your body can even start attacking its own tissues because it's recognizing that protein like a gluten, but also saying, hey, there's similar. Uh, similar proteins we're finding within the thyroid, and, and, and it's it's causing inflammation or you know obviously a disease there as well. Molecular mimicry. So take us back then to what does it mean? Eat dirt. Sure. Well, I use the title "Eat Dirt," and one of the big reasons is I walked in the, uh, the my mom's kitchen. My mom was shopping at the farmer's market. And she was scrubbing her, in fact, as a kid, my mom had me do this. She would have us scrub our potatoes to where they didn't have skin on them. The same thing with carrots. We'd peel them. Like, Lucky she didn't she, scrub you. 
<laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I mean, she was just, and my, my grandmother and it was this way too. Like she would have a, uh, it was like, if you've seen the movie, what about Bob? She always had a handkerchief yeah. like with doorknobs. So that my mom was a germ freak growing up and I walked in the kitchen. I said, mom, I said, just eat dirt. I said, you know, stop scrubbing everything, stopping it, you know, just going overboard with the antibiotics. And so this was a couple of years ago, so it made me think of the title of the book. But also, you know, I'd been recommending uh, soil-based probiotics for years, and then I came across a, uh, a, a journal reference where, where they talked about how uh, soil-based organisms that are found on our food today can actually help break down polysaccharides and actually help digest starches, which, which I thought was fascinating. And there's another great Japanese study where the researchers said uh, and, and showed in the study that people in Okinawa and er different areas of Japan were better able to break down seaweed. And I thought that was fascinating as well. In fact, in the study, they said it's, you know, by constantly consuming those, it's like your body is, has a new set of utensils. It's better at, uh, you know, digesting those in people in, um, you know, in North America. So, so in Eat Dirt, it really is about really balancing things out to where, you know, it, it, I understand that we have, um, sanitation is key. You know, it's, it's part of the reason why our lifespan has increased so much, but we've really swung this pendulum too far in the other direction where we've become so anti-dirt and anti-germ that we've, we've started, you know, we're, we're trading, um, I guess in, you know, certain, uh, basic infectious disease for now autoimmune disease, you know, and, and some of these other things that are happening within the body. So really Eat Dirt is about increasing your exposure to good microbes on a regular basis. There's a great study, I think it's published in the uh, um, Journal of Environmental Sciences, and they talk about how if you have a dog or cat, uh, specifically in children, it decreases your risk of asthma and allergies by 52%. And there's other, you know, similar studies on people that live on farms having, having similar benefits. So in Eat Dirt, I go through ways of increasing your microbial exposure, like having a dog, um, eating raw local honey. In fact, raw local honey contains over 200 uh, natural forms of pollen and microbes, which is beneficial. I talk about not just getting good bacteria in your diet, but also good fungi, such as medicinal mushrooms and good virus which are often referenced as uh, uh, bacteriophages, which are found in the ocean, and even good types of yeast like Sarcomyces boulardii, which is commonly found in probiotic, uh, certain probiotic supplements today, which is a yeast, um, and things like that. So I said, you know, don't, don't be anti-germ, don't be antibacterial, be pro-germ and pro-bacteria, and start getting, uh, you know, these good healthy exposures. And I use honey as one of those examples because, you know, people talk about how honey helps allergies, and it's been, been shown that in medical studies, but it's not just necessarily any honey. I think it's important that it's raw and it's local and actually has pollen and it, not waiting until you have allergies. Ideally, you'd be doing it year round in way. It's a sort of a micro or a nature's immunization over time when we're getting these natural exposures on a regular basis. That's right. Uh, Sayer G uh, was on the program uh, several months ago and on his website, Green Med Info, he has a really interesting discussion about how honey may act as a reservoir, allowing us to um, really store uh, the, these microbes and therefore their genetic material and re-inoculate ourselves. I want to go back to something you said earlier, and that was when you do, you're doing laboratory evaluation of patients and you mentioned uh, that they may have a, a wheat allergy or they may not. And I'd like you to elaborate on kind of the differentiation between having an out and out allergy to wheat versus the concept that gluten and specifically gliadin may represent a, an issue for people even beyond having a wheat allergy. Sure. Well, I, I think I understand your question. Um, when it comes to, um, obviously, there's different forms of testing as well. You, IgE, which is typically allergy, IgG, which we know is more of that sensitivity testing. And, and by the way, I, I, I do that testing. I look at it for myself. I don't believe it's always 100%. It's not that it's not accurate, but it's not, it, it doesn't, 100% tell us if somebody's actually intolerant to the food. I've act, I, I think I've seen to where maybe if somebody eats a food too much, it can show up uh, versus not having exposure to it. But I still think it's a good test. I still think it can um, you know show us some different things. But you know if we're talking about, um, and I'm going to answer this question how, uh, and, and if you want me to answer it in more detail, I'd no, love to. You're doing great. But one of the things I'm thinking about right now is, is that, you know, I, I don't think 
gluten for most people is well tolerated and I think it can cause allergies and food sensitivities in a majority of the population. I think the bigger problem today that we run into uh, ha has to do with, um, in many cases, food preparation as well. I think that's an issue. I think that um, you know, if we go back and we consume a natural form of gluten, or let's say it's lacto, it's sprouted and lacto fermented to where it is completely broken down, or as in Chinese medicine, they talk about putting it in a one pot or a crock pot and really cooking it slowly. Uh, I found for myself that when I I, I buy uh, something called a germinated rice, brown rice, and I cook it in bone broth overnight for about 12 to 24 hours to where it just it's it's um complete mush i digest it really really well in fact i noticed that it's it really is good for me and my and in my in, in my bowel movements and things like that so i i think that um i think sometimes we make gluten and some of these proteins villains when in fact i don't necessarily think they always have to be i think we've really lost the art of proper food preparation especially when it comes to fermentation um, of course, you know, sprouting and germination and, and that type of thing. So um, anyways, I know that doesn't necessarily answer your question, but I think that uh, gluten itself, I, I think it probably is the biggest issue today. But I believe it's the biggest issue because we've lost the the form or, or the right way of, of preparing foods properly. You know, you had a, a nice section in your book talking about the prebiotic fibers and how important they are for nurturing uh, good uh, probiotic uh, organisms within us. And how we are really uh, quite almost devoid of good pre sources of prebiotic uh, fiber in our diets today. And you brought up a really interesting point, and that was that unpasteurized apple cider vinegar is actually a relatively good source of prebiotic fiber. You know, normally when you're thinking about fiber, you're thinking of sawdust or, or uh, <laughs> something that looks like shredded wheat. Yeah. But it was a bit surprising that you'd mentioned that. Tell us about that. Sure. Well, you know, there there are there are different types of prebiotics. And when people hear prebiotic, typically typically they're thinking of, you know, in inulin fiber, uh, asparagus, um, artichokes, uh, dandelion greens, even sometimes um, you know, plantains or ban bananas that aren't completely ripe. Those tend to be very high in those prebiotic fibers, but also looking at raw honey is an excellent uh, prebiotic as are medicinal mushrooms. You know, shiitake mushroom, which is very popular in the Chinese diet. In fact, if you are in the um, both Chinese and Japanese diet, in fact, they do a lot of miso soup with shiitake and green onion. Talk about, and, and broth. I mean, talk about a gut healing remedy. Yeah, yeah. Absol absolutely amazing. So, um, so yeah, so it doesn't always have to be necessarily one of the, you know, a fruit or vegetables. Um, and it doesn't ac actually always need to be necessarily what we would think of as uh, necessarily fiber. In fact, I even believe lactose is a very strong prebiotic as well, which is found in something like you know just a you know a goat's milk or or, or cow's milk, which along with uh, galactosaccharides that are found, <laughs> you know obviously in human and human breast milk. Uh, right. One of my favorite uh, vegetables is jicama, mm. and it sure seems to be tough. I'm in, in Southwest Florida to find an organic jicama, so maybe that's what I'll end up doing the rest of my life. I'll be a jicama farmer. <laughs> I think it's they're kind of hard to grow, uh, but that said, uh, commercially, I really like acacia gum, and they they sell at the health food store. There are various products that contain acacia gum. It's a very complex uh, oligomer of um, fructose, and uh, you know it's a very very powerful prebiotic fiber. So you know one of the good things is you don't really lose prebiotic fiber content when these foods are are cooked, so you retain that. But it was interesting you mentioned that, you know because people are drinking a lot of this uh, apple cider vinegar uh, or using it a lot and uh, what a what a nice thing to know that that's a good source of prebiotic fiber. What about fermented foods? What can you tell us there? Sure. Well, you know I'm a huge fan of fermented foods and I, I think that again this is I really hit on this in, in my book. But you know we've really lost the art of fermentation. You know part of the reason why people fermented foods. Uh, hundreds of years ago um, is for preservation purposes. You know, it's uh, in fact a, another sort of side note in, eat, in talking about eating dirt. You know, I was uh, also reading about uh, people used to take cabbage, dig a hole and throw cabbage in the ground and how it would naturally ferment. But also many of those soil-based organisms and it being where it was in the dirt really help in preservation. But, but you know, some of my favorite probiotic-rich foods, one, um, this totally transformed my mom's health, but we went and got 
raw goat's milk kefir. We drove out to this small Amish farm out in Ohio and would get that every single week. She would get her goat's milk kefir. And I think many people tolerate goat's milk better, but kefir really is the king of probiotic foods. It typically has the most diversity in terms of strains from what I've seen. And it really has so many benefits. In fact, one of the things we did with my mom is we did sort of a twist on something called the Budwig protocol, where what so we I had her- Budwig, eh? absolutely. You, so what we'd had her do was my mom, um, we had her do a, a, a cup of goat's milk kefir, uh, a tablespoon of flax oil, a tablespoon or two of flax meal, and then actually would also put a teaspoon of turmeric in there, and she would drink that every morning for breakfast and uh, saw great results with it. Also sauerkraut, uh, you know, sauerkraut and kimchi and fermented vegetables have a... Uh, I have a strain called Lactobacillus plantarum, which has been shown to be really, really great for um, for supporting digestive health. Um, also, um, uh, another favorite of mine is coconut kefir. If somebody uh, doesn't want to do dairy, I think coconut kefir is a good option. Also, there's a new uh, beverage that I think a lot more people are going to be seeing on their shelf called Kvass. Uh, today, oftentimes, it actually traditionally was done as a fermented um, grain, like fermented barley. Uh, but today, they're doing fermented beets, which which I think is fantastic, especially for athletes or people who have heart issues or really want to nourish their blood. Kvass can be can be great as well. Um, but I think just in general, adding you know one to two servings of fermented foods to your diet a day can just boast some tremendous benefits. And I love one of my favorite recipes is I had my mom also do a we called it a, a probiotic peach smoothie where she would do a cup of peaches. Uh, she would do some kefir, a little bit of raw honey, some cinnamon, and maybe some collagen protein powder and drink that every single day. And I think that's an, you know another uh, you know a, a good way to get it in. It is uh, very compelling that uh, so much of our common uh, disease situation is really now focused on, and you make such a great point in your book about uh, focused on gut permeability. I mean, everything from, as you mentioned, Hashimoto's, ADHD, autism, Alzheimer's, uh, you have a whole list. And I think uh, that still people are going to be quite surprised uh, to, to look at the wide net that is thrown by this notion of changes in the gut bacteria, how they affect the permeability of the gut, and therefore how these uh, changes stimulate the immune system and take it really out of balance. Well, you know, I, I think when people hear the term leaky gut, I think very often they think, well, that sounds like a really serious uh, digestive issue in terms of symptoms. And so if somebody would have maybe uh, inflammatory bowel disease, they would think, well, I have leaky gut. But I think oftentimes the person with headaches and joint pain um, or somebody who's struggling with uh, depression or a thyroid issue, they, their mind doesn't typically go to thinking, well, I have leaky gut because we tie that with digestive issues. But I know that I've taken care of plenty of patients over the years who have no gas, no bloating, uh, and, and they still have leaky gut. So I think that's one of the important things to consider is that as Hippocrates, I know we've both re referenced over 2,000 years ago, all disease begins in the gut. It's also important to know that all health begins in the gut as well. And this is well really said. where, and, and this is really where, you know, I know as you teach, if somebody is struggling with um, depression or something like joint pain. You know, the system today, and I, I see this a lot of times, uh, Dr. Perlmutter, with people both in conventional as well as even the natural realm. If somebody has an issue such as arthritis, we tend to say, okay, well, we're going to try and treat that with an anti-inflammatory herb or anti-inflammatory medication. Well, really, my take in the book, as well as something I've seen you do incredibly well, is really saying, okay, well, we really, if disease begins in the gut, let's go ahead and heal the gut. I mean, we can, and of course, things like ginger and turmeric, you know, because they're anti-inflammatory, they help the joints. But really, I mean, is that be coming from right from the joints, or because we're reducing inflammation of the gut? So, you know, I really believe that no matter what somebody is struggling with, focusing on healing and sealing the gut is of primary importance. And so, you know, one of the diet, the diet that I typically put people on, is a diet that's very rich in collagen. In a, in a diet that's very easy to digest, you know, I, I don't actually believe there's a food that heals us. And I think that's an important point for people to consider that if I have a cut on my hand, um, I don't need to put an ointment on there. I mean, of course, you don't want it to get infected, but there's nothing I can put on there to heal it. The body heals itself. And this is why fasting has been used for, 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 for thousands of years and the people have reaped the benefits. But I think that fasting can be used, but I guess the point I'm trying to make here is it's not necessarily about 
getting as much stuff as you can because I think that's what people tend to try and do is I want to get everything I can. It's letting your body rest. It's the most important thing we can do. And so this is why what I've taught my patients to do is a lot of times do some intermittent fasting. And when they're eating, eat things to where your body's doing very little work. This is what I love about bone broth. It's already in its amino acid form. It's, it's very easy for the body to digest. That's what I love about cooked vegetables. Your body's doing very little work. And so the ideal meal, I believe, for people healing leaky gut and getting the root cause of disease is doing a simple slow cooker crock pot overnight with a lot of vegetables, organic meat, and herbs. That's it. Those things thrown in a, co- a crock pot, consuming that, uh, you know, sometimes three meals a day as I've done that with my patients, um, or sometimes adding in some probiotic foods with that. Probiotics are great because not only are they high in probiotics, but most of those foods are pre-digested for you so it's easier to digest. So I think that's a key concept as well as, hey, your body heals itself. Make it as easy as you can on, on, your, on your own body. Well, let's say, uh, like myself, you are asked the question, well, gee, Dr. X, what do I do with your program because I'm a vegetarian or I'm vegan? (laughs) Yeah, I do get that question a lot. And and here's- I'm sure you do. Yeah, and and here's what I recommend. If somebody is a vegan, uh, I recommend that they focus on doing a couple of things. But number one, focus on foods that actually support collagen production. Uh, within the body because if you do a bone broth, we know the benefit is you're getting amino acids like proline and glutamine, which are great for gut repair. But there are also other foods out there that support that. Asparagus, uh, beets are fantastic for this. Um, Seaweed is actually probably the best. Uh, Things like spirulina, chlorella, ALA, any type of kelp. Um, But, you know, consuming a food that's really high in these amino acids that help support or have that specific amino acid profile. So it it can definitely be done. I mean, you can do a veggie broth. I think mushrooms are great, especially shiitake mushrooms. Uh, Adding those into a soup, doing some miso can be great. Um, Again, that's an organic form of a fermented soy. I don't recommend soy in a lot of cases or most of the conventional today. But if you're looking at a miso, I think that's a good option. So um, so there are ways to get around it. And I I believe that's also where supplementation becomes important as well. I think really making sure you're getting uh, vitamin B12 12, you're getting um, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, EPA, DHA, um, and EPA might be you know, pr- pretty hard to get in that case, but you can definitely get DHA and some, and, some, uh, uh, um, and some ALA there and some flax and chia and walnuts and things yeah, like that. DHA so, for, as an algae-derived source, and uh, you know, I often uh, really have to note that we've got to be super careful in terms of vitamin D as well, but I think you bring up a good point that with a variety of of vegetarian sources, you can construct protein out of the essential amino acids. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And so I think that it, it just it's a um, it's just making sure you're balanced, as you're saying. It's really looking at your diet, making sure you're covering your bases. And also, if if somebody is choosing to be vegan, I think it would be worthwhile doing something like a a, a, a micronutrient test or organic acids test, and making sure your B12 levels and certain other other nutrients are where they should be. You know, finding a good doctor of functional medicine who can work with you to sort of get a baseline, so you know uh, if you are deficient in certain amino acids or, or vitamins. And um, honey, how does that uh, factor in? Because it is an animal product made by bees. Well, you know, in, in working with a lot of um, vegans and vegetarians, I, 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 I never know what, um, you know, which, which line they're going to fall, you know, which side of the line they're going to fall on. So if somebody can do honey, I think they, they, uh, it, there's so many benefits there as being my favorite natural sweetener. And if they don't, you know, there, there are... Um, other ways to get your microbial exposures, as I mentioned, you know, having a pet uh, is a great way. Um, you know, just getting outside more on a regular basis, taking a soil-based probiotic supplement, a regular probiotic supplement on a regular basis, can can uh, can have have a lot of benefits. So I would say, you know, the other thing is making sure you're getting plenty of probiotics because you know there there was a great uh, study done in Stanford. Um, just several years ago, and and I think they were doing it on patients who had had gastric bypass, and they were looking at the essentially how probiotics affected uh, these patients. And one of the things they found was um, 
they had a much higher level, in fact, 49% higher levels of vitamin B12 and much higher levels of all the other B vitamins when they were taking a probiotic supplement. So we know, I mean, we've all heard the principle, you are what you eat. It's not completely true. Really, you are what you digest. And so I think also for vegetarians, um, it, it'd be important to consider doing supplementation with probiotics and focusing on those probiotic-rich foods because... Uh, you know, absorption of those nutrients is, is probably just as important or more important as well. Well, you made a point earlier, and I, I think it bears repeating, and that is that um, uh, it's always good to test. And if uh, here's a situation, uh, being vegetarian, where you're at risk for low B12, low vitamin D, low minerals, etc. So, I mean, there are straightforward blood tests available for you. You may as well get them done and see where you are. And you know these are wonderful diets. We, you know, people have been talking about the health benefits of vegetarianism for a long time, with certain caveats. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up. So I want to thank you for your time. It's been a very, very uh, interesting interview. And uh, all the best on the new book. I'm sure it's going to be <laughs> very, very successful for you. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Dr. Perlmutter. I also have a I have a leaky gut quiz. If anybody wants to check it out, they can go to the website isyourgutleaking.com and, and learn if they have leaky gut. I have recommendations from there. But want to say main, get, uh, your main website is uh, my website's drax.com. So just d r a x e dot com, and we've got a lot of healthy gut healing recipes on there, uh, some different uh, health programs and other things as well. So, um, so yeah, I want to say, hey, thanks for having me on. Again, I've, I've followed your work for years, and I'm a huge fan of every, every, everything you're doing, and uh, I appreciate you having me. Well, I appreciate it as well. We'll talk soon. Great. Thanks, Doc. Bye-bye. Well, I don't know about you, but I learned a lot today. This was a fascinating interview with Dr. Axe. Again, here is his new book, uh, Eat Dirt. And, uh, you know, it really says a lot about the so-called hygiene hypothesis that we're not doing ourselves any good by all of this incredible attention we pay uh, to making sure that our environments are sterile. And beyond that, uh, I think what an interesting discussion about the effect upon the human microbiome negatively by certain drugs to which we are exposed, drugs that are so commonly used in our society. So. Uh, an interesting interview, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. 